only apply to new hires. And it shows what the reduction would be five years out, 10 years out, and then ultimately. So this here, this slide here shows the results of the packages we were asked to evaluate. Um, I won't, there are a lot of numbers there. I'm happy to answer any particular one, but obviously the, you know, the more, uh, members that are covered, for example, packages, you know, eight and 10, obviously the bigger the reduction in the unfunded accrued liability. Um, and it's you know, basically that's a, that's a no brainer. But the ones that do affect more than membership, and that's that rush to the door concept. And that's something that the board will want to think about if packages eight through 11 do have some consideration. And what rush to the door means is since that provision affects all non-retired excluding drop participants, the membership has an incentive to retire sooner than they otherwise might would have to be covered under the 3% compound COLA provision. So some of the savings that you thought you might were going to get gets offset by the fact that people, i.e. rush to the door. They, they retire sooner than they otherwise would have um, because they want to be covered under the 3% compound COLA provision. And you know, we've seen that happen in other systems where, where groups like that were, were affected. Uh, so for the purposes of the results of packages eight through 11, it was assumed that expected retirements would be 25% higher over the three years following the June 30th valuation date. And there's no magic there with respect to the three years, it was just something that there's no right number, but depending upon how long it would take to, to implement the benefit, we thought that was a reasonable thing to do. And that those retirements would not be covered under the new COLA provisions. So the, remember that we also looked at 15 year projections of the unfunded accrued liability, the funded ratio and the computed employer contribution rates. Uh, and the computed amortization periods. I'm not intending to go through all of the uh, slides, but I just want the board to, to remember that it was assumed that the proposed benefit changes would be effective as of June 30th, 2022. All of the projections were based upon the minus 5% market value return scenario for fiscal year 2020. I think right now, if memory serves, we might be doing a little bit better than that. Uh, given where the, the market has, has went over the past couple of months, which is very encouraging news. But to be consistent with what the board has seen in the April and May presentations, we thought we shouldn't switch this one because that's what the board has seen. Um, for the COLA changes, the July 1st, 2022 COLA is the first COLA assumed to, to be effective. Now, in the past, the board has actually seen 15 years worth of numbers there, but we wanted the board to be able to see the packages on all of these slides. So you can see the provisions towards the top of, of each of the uh, tables. The thing you'll notice is we've showed annual results for the periods ending June 30th, 2020 through 2024 but then the following two rows are five years later. So then you see June 30th, 2029, and then June 30th, uh, 2034, so that there's no confusion from the board there. I'm not, I was not planning on going through all of the results of the packages. The, the board has had, I, I believe, the presentation for a few days now, but I would be happy to answer um, any questions that the board may have with respect to, to any of the packages. The, the final thing I'll say is, and this goes back to what we have said before, there really is no right answer as to what legislative changes should or should not be pursued. We've, we've heard very eloquently from, from the membership, uh, the three individuals that spoke this morning. So you, you, have, you have member feedback. The, board, I think, has a lot of common ground on changes that came through in the 11 packages. Um, for example, 
you know, I think each and every one of the packages had an increase in the member contribution rate. There's a lot of, you know, discussion with there should be a two, a four, an eight year phase in period, and, and that's open for, for board discussion. Uh, the majority of the packages, um, well, the, I think every one of the packages had to change to the FAC period. So there's a lot of common ground there amongst the board. You know, the vesting period, um, uh, there is some common ground, but I think there's some thought about extending it. The, the other thing I'll mention there is extending the vesting period and increasing the member contribution rate sort of have an offsetting effect. And what I mean by that is if you increase the member contribution rate, for example, let's, let's say it goes up to, to 7%. Well, increasing the vesting period really doesn't help very much. The reason being is most members now, given that the member contribution rate is so high or higher, I don't wanna say so high, but higher, they're gonna take a refund of their contributions. So increasing the member contribution rate to seven, but extending the vesting period to eight or 10 years sort of have a, a neutralizing effect. So that might be an, something that the board may want to consider in, when you're looking at those two provisions um, and which membership groups should or should not be covered. I, I think there were very good points made on uh, some of the issues there. Um, and with that, we'll be happy to take any questions the board may have. Uh, Madam Chairman? Yes, Daryl, go ahead. Uh, uh, expound on that. You, you said that increasing the vesting periods will, uh, will, will, I want you to expand on that last statement. Sure. You said they will take a refund uh, of their, uh, what, what do you mean by that? So if we increase the best right now, the vesting period is five years and our member contribution rate is 5%. So if I'm an individual with seven or eight years of service, I've been contributing to the retirement system 5% of my pay over that seven or eight year period. I now have to take into consideration what's more valuable to me? The member contributions that I've made over that seven to eight year period, which were based upon the 5% of pay member contribution rate, or waiting perhaps 20 to 25 years to take a vested deferred benefit. Because in, in many instances, our member may terminate at age 30 or, or, or um, 35, and take that de deferred vested benefit at age 65. If okay. we increase the member contribution rate to 7%, then obviously their account balance is going to be higher by, by seven fifths. You know, it's, it's just they're contributing 7% of pay instead of the 5% of pay. So the value of their account balance obviously goes up because of that, such that even if we didn't extend the vesting period, we might have a situation where members, more members are gonna take a refund of their contributions just because of that, because their account balances were higher if the board decided to increase the member contribution rate, for example, to 7%. Madam Chair. That is, that, that, that is, that is a very lucid explanation and you have cleared it up for me. I understand that. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, uh, Jason. Madam Chair, uh, to follow up on that question though, uh, an employee does not become vested. What happens to the employer, the state's contribution to the program? It's not refunded back to the state. It, does it not remain, uh, the funds remain within the system? The funds What's remain right? within the system, no matter if the vesting period is a five year period or a 10 year period. So the state's contribution would remain within the system, even though the employee might take their 5% back or 7% or 6%. Exactly correct. And then that goes to help finance the benefits of the longer service employees. So that's a true, very true statement. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead, Jackson. <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, I, had, I had this set aside. May I ask you to go all the way back, and if you wouldn't mind maybe even putting back on the slides, slides uh, six, the slide on page six and the slide on page seven. So my first question to you is uh, observing, reading through this, obviously there, and on, I saw the averages and that's excellent. Can you tell me the effect to the program of years when we have negative rates, like in 2012, when we went 0.4 or 2015, when we go, uh, or excuse me, 2016, we go 0.01. What is the effects on the overall funding of the system in years where we actually go negative from your perspective and review of our numbers? I'll answer that question, but I, I think there's a, a follow-up answer that that's necessary. Okay. okay. Because remember that our target isn't zero. Our target is the number to the rate. So we were, for example, in 2012, we were expecting to earn 8%. We earned negative 0.4. So we fell short by 8.4%. So for example, in, if that would have happened this year, that would have increased our unfunded accrued liability by about 650 to $700 million. That's what that means. Now that's also true, even if you have a positive return, but it's less than the assumption. So for example, in 2015, even though that 2.2% was positive, we still were short of our target our target was 7.75, so short by about five and a half percent. So that also increased our unfunded accrued liability. If that would have happened this year, that would have been about a $400 million uh, increase in our unfunded accrued liability. So it's not, the barometer isn't zero. Now, obviously negative returns are gonna be even worse than, than positive returns, but, but the bogey isn't zero. It's that right-hand column. It's the, the 5%, or so, is the 8% or the 7.75 and, and so forth, 7 .5. Sure. So the flip side of that is, and yes, I do hope to retire one day in this system. So what about 2011 when you have three times what our, our target was, or 2014 when you have two and a, half, or two and a percentage? Uh, does that offset the negative or the years where we don't quite hit our target, or how does that affect the system? Because it's a two-sided coin. And the answer to that is no, it doesn't offset it. So think about it in, in this fashion. Let's say we start off with a $100 and we first have a negative 50% return. So now we have $50 and now we have a positive 50% return. You don't get back to 100. You only get back to 75 because 50% on the positive side is a $25. So the negative 50 and positive 50 do not offset each other because of that compound. Okay, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, if I may, please. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Could, could we go to the slide on page seven, please? And I guess my reaction to this is uh, I was observing the two decades and from 2001 to 2010, I noticed that we had five years under 3% uh, CPI, one that was actually negative and only four plus. And then in this, in this decade that we're in, uh, 2011, we had six years under 3% three, uh, three CPI, one negative and only two above. Uh, looking at in the long term, General comments about that as far as what it, how it affects not only the, the retirement system, but how it affects, I guess, the individual members that you can share with us. Any thoughts on that? For, well, let me first start with um, how it affects the system. Yes, please. If, if we believe that part of inflation ties into investment returns, so for example, fixed income returns and equity returns and, and things of that nature. Obviously the lower inflation um, 
translates into lower investment returns for the system. For the membership with the 3% CAM panel COLA, if the increases in CPI are less than the 3% CAM panel COLA, then if CPIW is a reasonable representation of price increases for a retiree population, and there's debate about that, um, because remember CPIW takes into account the entire basically population, uh, or let me say in actives and, and retirees. Um, then the individual's purchasing power increases during the period of, of their retirement. They're receiving uh, COLA increases more than sufficient, then is necessary to at least uh, offset the increase in consumer price indices, in, indices, at least as measured by CPIW. So th that is the effect. Now, the, what you have to take into consideration is what you've heard so far, um, and that is individuals have already retired and perhaps have made decisions based upon the current benefit provisions. So um, that is a very, um, it's a very important point to consider. Not saying that things should happen one way or the other, but it's very difficult for a current retiree to alter their planning as opposed to say a new hire. And I would suggest that consideration may want to be made if you were designing a new Arkansas Public Employee Retirement System plan today, going forward, let's say it just didn't exist, what COLA provision would you actually want to include uh, as, the, as the appropriate benefit provision? And that's just something for the board's consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Other questions? I have a, a comment, a question. Judge Hudson, go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, outstanding uh, work. Uh, these presentations that you've been doing, I think, are, are informative and they're very helpful, um, not only to the board, but to anybody that is interested in observing our discussion now and is concerned about the, uh, the retirement system. Um, I was looking back through my notes from um, January 17, 2018, when we had a, a joint uh, education session. We had the uh, members of the retirement committee that chose to come uh, the board and the staff there, we had presentations from Cal and N from GRS. It happened to uh, snow that day, so some of the attendance was down. But I, I took uh, a lot of notes, and one of the presentations, I think it was GRS uh, made, uh, they looked at um, the long-term solution to the uh, percentage of active members and the payroll and uh, there was um, a chart and they, uh, they uh, reported, and that would have been in January 17, 2018, that uh, the payouts that at that point uh, from the system were 30% of our assets. The contributions being from employers and employees were 19% uh, because uh, some of the employees didn't are non-contributory. And so when you take the difference between the, the amount paid out percentage-wise and the contributions, there was a difference of 11%. So then you could look at that 11% and your um, earnings and did that make that up? If not, then it's um, a liability. And so the unfunded actuarial, accrued actual liability has been the big issue. Um, I thought that that percentage was simple. It was, it was, um, it was more clear perhaps than, uh, than some other examples. And, and um, I, I don't remember if you were there and made that or if that was one of your partners, but uh, 
uh, I would point that out as far as uh, clarity on, on uh, how much money is going out percentage wise from our assets and how much money is uh, being contributed from the sources and then what we're earning in the challenge. Uh, and, and in that regard, I would ask you this question. What is a reasonable or a prudent time frame for us to reduce the unfunded accrued actuarial liability? Um, how do we approach that? Do we, do we approach that by reducing the amortization period to keep the unfunded accrued actuarial liability from increasing? Uh, or do we um, reduce um, um, both the, um, um, the liability and the, um, the, the uh, amortization period? What is it? We have the prudent investor rule legislated. What guidelines should we adopt? What What is your feedback on on that that question? Um, well, the prudent investor rule I don't think applies to the the actuarial funding policy. I think that's how you're supposed to invest the assets. I think you're, and I'm not. By no stretch of the imagination, an expert on fiduciary responsibility on the investment side, but I think the the prudent invest investor rule has more to do with the investment policy than the actuarial funding policy. With respect to what the board should consider in trying to reduce that unfunded actuarial accrued liability, you you've brought up some very good points and, and questions, uh, Judge Hudson, and. Um, it's a, I think the best way I can say it is there are trade-offs that in a perfect world, would we like to see the amortization period at 17 years or less? I think the answer is yes, but we don't live in a perfect world. And if that was, that meant that there had to be severe benefit cuts to achieve that, then I do think there's more flexibility in that amortization period than, than, than in a perfect world because we don't live in a perfect world. We are at the mercy of, and we've said this before, we are at the mercy of the markets. And it would be unfortunate if, let's say more severe benefit reductions were made and let's say investment returns really you know went through the roof or whatever the case may be and now we're at an amortization period of four or five years so and i think we've heard this before you don't want to overreact but there are certain actuarial considerations and we've talked about this negative amortization you know, in a perfect world, would we like to see the unfunded accrued liability decrease in nominal terms? I think the answer is, is, is yes. But does it have to? And I think the answer is, is no. Um, we talked about certain things that the board, this gives us more flexibility. What it doesn't do is guarantee anything because the board, through a very thoughtful process is gonna come up with the legislative package. And remember that these considerations or these discussions happened before COVID-19, it was before the pandemic. And that threw another monkey wrench where, you know, back in February and March, the sky was falling, but then April through June, there was a very nice recovery. So to make, make, to make decisions on benefit provisions that affect our membership based solely on short-term actuarial numbers, I would suggest the board might want to um, not go down that path.
Well, thank you. Uh, I, I would uh, also comment on Larry's uh, sense of urgency. I, I think that uh, defining the sense of urgency to take action is, is uh, you know, a concept that we all share. It's going to be the application of that. And the, uh, I think the input that we've gotten from the associations has been helpful. And hopefully uh, with the amount of work that's been put forth here, uh, we can identify uh, common ground. There might not be uh, all of the components in any one of these 11 packages that uh, we prefer, but perhaps we can uh, identify uh, pieces of each one that we prefer and, and get down to the uh, two or three to consider, hopefully in a July special, another special meeting. Madam Chairman. Yes, Gary, go ahead. Um, I, I agree, but I think there, the work that's been done here is very helpful and I've read through those and uh, I appreciate also the comments we've heard today from the different organizations. And it helped me to realize that there are three things, legal aspects, public relations aspects, and employee morale that we need to take into account as we think of all these things. And I'm, for, uh, I'm all for reducing the unfunded liability as much as possible and as quickly as possible but I do think we have to consider those factors and the legislative reality of what uh, someone said last meeting, what would a legislator actually take up for a vote? So I just want to go ahead and say that reading through all of these, the one that I am leaning toward is uh, scenario number two. Uh, be the COLA op the COLA provision, I don't think we could expect any support for anything other than a COLA change for new hires. The uh, changing to 7%, I think, should be stretched out uh, for a long time because of employee morale and with the meager raises that they've been seeing and increases in health insurance. It is, as someone said earlier, it's possible that an employee could have less pay this year than last year if all of these things hit at the same time. The five-year averaging, I think, is good for salaries, especially with what GRS is proposing with the three-year uh, lock on the three-year average, and then look at the five-year beyond that. And the eight-year vesting, I think, is a kind of a compromise. I personally am okay with just keeping the vesting at five years. I understand the argument uh, that the um, Municipal League made about the slow bleeding and the many cuts. That's a, that was a good argument of people who are just getting into the system and working five years and being able to take out some retirement. So I'm okay with the idea of stretching that out. And I think scenario two suggests an eight year vesting period, which I see as kind of a compromise there. So there you go. Though I just thought I'd go ahead and throw that out. And um, we've had some really good discussions for several months. So I'm at peace about kind of declaring where, where I am leaning or where I'm uh, um, uh, my thoughts on these different scenarios. And again, I want to appreciate the good work that, that um, our staff and GRS have done to help simplify all this for us. So, thank you. Thank you, Gary, for that comment on um, package number two. Uh, does anybody else have uh, any questions about that or any comments about package number two or any other package that you might want to uh, uh, talk about? Madam Chairman, uh, this is Daryl. Uh, uh, I, I, I can only kind of echo what, 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 what I've heard, but uh, obviously reducing our unfunded liability is a priority for me. 
I mean, with a $2.3 billion unfunded liability, that is something that really, I think, commands our attention. But I think we need to be cautious uh, in our approach with regard to how we how we handle that. I think with regard to the vesting periods, I think if we if we look at this as a knee jerk reaction, and we look at the uh, which would be the ideal amortization period of 17 years, I think that's unrealistic. I think I think that's what you you're looking at in a perfect world. Um, and I don't, I don't think that, uh, I think if we're looking at, uh, what, where the market is right now, uh, and where we've seen the market move just over the last several months, we've seen 401ks go, uh, into the negative and now they're in the positive. And so I don't think that we can look short term. I think we have to look long term, uh, in, in, in that, in that area. And so. Uh, that would be my comment uh, based on what I've heard so far. Madam Chairman. Uh, Andrea, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, something else to consider um, is one of the reasons um, state employees were not able to get raises, um, the uh, Governor Hutchinson said is, is they're looking at the budget as a whole and therefore something that's important to me is uh, as well as being at 80 percent funded is the employer contribution since it comes out of the same pot as the raises and i think i just would throw that out there um mr carnahan i i think uh package two is um reasonable i would agree with you I was, um, I made a kind of a summary sheet of what appears to be um, something we all, uh, when I look at all the packages that, that comes about, and that is raising the, the contribution rate to 7% over four or more years. Um, I, I it, it, from the common ground of all the different packages, it's kind of fun seeing everyone's package and not knowing whose was whose. As a matter of fact, when I read them, I had to question which one was mine, which one I asked about. But it appears we all agree, or the majority of us agree on 7% uh, brought in at a slow rate for four or more years. It appears um, uh, we're all pretty comfortable with changing the FAC to five or more years uh, for non-vested and new hires. And I think that covers our... Um, that covers what Mr. Hayes shared, which is, hey, when someone gets vested, it starts getting dicey as to what you can or can't do. Um, and then going to the vesting period, uh, it, it, it appears that we're all good with um, five or more years there, again, for non-vested or new hires. And, and the COLA, you know, I, I, I agree with uh, Judge Hudson. I think that's obviously the least palatable for anyone currently in the system. Um, it does seem to have a big impact financially, however. So there was, it seems like going to simple for everyone that's non-vested. Uh, and then uh, the CPI 3%. For new hires. Um, but those are the common grounds I found. And of course, none of these totally fit into that. I think uh, packages 7, 9, 11 come fairly close. But uh, after all the work we've done, I, I agree with what others have said. I think we're coming really close to coming up with a package that um, addresses the unfunded liability that addresses um, not wanting to throw too much at any employee and yet um, bringing us up uh, with what the other systems are doing. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Andrea. Other comments from anyone? Uh, Madam Chairman, I just would echo what uh, uh, Ms. Lee had just said. Uh, not only does it bring us in line with I think with what other systems are doing, but I think it 
I, I think where we're getting to is very close to what uh, makes sense for our system. And I think that's what this meeting was, is really all about, is what makes sense for APERS. Uh, it's not about teachers. It's not about any of the other systems. It's what makes sense for APERS. Uh, and I think we're getting close to that. And uh, I think uh, uh, the comments that have uh, so far been been voiced are, are all going in that direction. And I think that's welcomed. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Daryl. Madam Chair. Yes, Jason, go ahead. If I may, please. Uh, Looking at package two, I, I definitely agree phasing in. Uh, I think that would work. Uh, five years, all actives, I, I guess I'd, I'd take a little exception to the word all actives. I'm assuming that would be new hires and non-vested uh, because all, uh, just throwing that out. Uh, eight, eight years, new hires. Oh, sure. Yep. I, I, so, so let's clear what all actives means. That truly, yes, means, all, that truly means all active members but it has a hold harmless provision. So your three year FAC would be computed at the time of the legislative change. But then going forward, you would have a five year FAC computed. You would get the higher of the two. So in package, where it says five years for all active members, it truly is all active members. Um, draw, you know, people that are participating in the drop, they've already had their FAC computed. Because okay. they're in the drop and their benefits already established. But it's, it also has that hold harmless provision where you would have a three year FAC computed at the time of the benefit change. But then going forward, as you earn more salaries, you would then have a five year FAC computed. You would get the higher of the two. You would get the higher of the three year frozen FAC or the new five year FAC that would take into account salaries earned after the benefit change. So I just wanted to well, clarify that point. And that's part of the reason why I was asking all the participants today about what is a line in the sand of those folks not vested. Uh, so I, I do want to throw that ingredient um, on the counter in the soup for everyone's concern. I, I uh, and this is maybe more personal for me or from my perspective in, in employment and state government, the eight, uh, eight years for new hire for vesting. Uh, the only thought I will pass on is I was fortunate to serve a governor. Uh, he was in the office for 10 and a half years, but you do have those who serve and they only get eight years. And I do wonder if it maybe shouldn't be considered for seven years, uh, just because you'll have some folks who uh, may not by a few days be able to get eight years in that or for elected officials who may want to run and maybe don't want to serve uh you know maybe not, don't get the second term or complete the second term that's just a thought and then my final item is and again i go back to my question to uh to everyone to mark and chris and everyone of where is that fine line between between now, let's say July 1 of this year to July 1 of 2022, what is that fine line about those not vested that have just got into the system as far as the uh, COLA and uh, how that affects them? So uh, I don't know that I have a resolution to propose, but I do wonder if that shouldn't be considered by this board because uh, that's two to three years away and that's two to three years of employees that affect the system 20 and 30 years down the road. So don't know that I have a solution. I just add that comment. Thank you, Jason. Other comments, additional comments? Anyone? Yeah, Madam Chair, Andrea yeah. here. Andrea, go ahead. Oh, whoops, I stopped my video there. Um, one of the questions I asked of Duncan a while back, because it's been, it's been thrown out a little bit, is non-contributory active members versus contributory active members. Um, uh, I was contacted by uh, state employees who said, well, how about those that aren't contributing anymore or haven't, you know, and, and so I asked Duncan for a breakdown and uh, you guys can't see my screen, but 
we have 36,475 active members that are contributory and 8,804 that are currently non-contributory. 36,475 contributory, 8,804 non-contributory. That's our active members. That's not our retire, retired members. Our retired members, of, of course, the far majority of them were non-contributory because that's how the system was for years back then. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that piece of information in here. To me, it the non-contributory members are, are uh, I don't think, are, are that uh, much of a strain on the system. So I, I, I told the, the state employees that contacted me that, you know, they're slowly being phased out anyway. So I just thought I'd share those numbers with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Andrea, for, for making that point. Madam Chair, this is Dale Douthat. Uh, comments, questions? Uh, from Mr. Dreslov. Go ahead. Mr. Dreslov, I'm looking at packages two and seven, and when I look down at the, uh, the other charts there, and it shows the amount of funded um, liabilities that we would have, both of them come in around 80% um, in that last category in 2034 can you tell me what makes those end up the same as far as the funded liability there's got to be something in package two that is because i, I look at the cola talks about a compound and in package seven the cola is simple uh what's getting us to the same bottom line there uh, because package two seems to be um, a little more of a conservative approach than package seven, but we end up in the same place. Can you tell me what factor you think is really driving that? I think one of the things might be this slide here. So the, the, the simple versus the compound, if you look 10 years out, there's not a significant difference in the member's benefit. So for the, the simple COLA, it was 11,631 and they're 11,751. So I think that's one of the things that um, the lower the COLA percentage, the less difference you're going to see with, with simple versus campaign. I'm also trying to see the different, so package seven. Package seven, if you look at the FAC period, that only affected non-vested and new hires, the five-year period. But on package two, that affected all active members. So package two covered a bigger proportion of our membership with respect to the FAC period. So that goes the opposite direction. Package two is more of savings in that respect than package seven. Package two has a little bit less savings on the member contribution rate because that has the eight year phase in versus the four year phase in on package seven. So package seven is a little bit more um, savings in, in that respect. Package seven also has a little bit more savings on the um, COLA provision because of the simple versus the compound. But as we saw on that one slide, it's not that big a significant difference. Hopefully I, I answered your question, uh, Mr. Duffin. Yes, sir, and I guess I'm concerned about the, the FAC period affecting all members um, under package two gives me a little concern, uh, and I guess that's maybe why I'm leaning towards package seven. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Um, not overly, but the one thing I'll mention on package two is the closer you are to retirement, the less effect that has. So for example, if, if I retire, let's say the day after the benefit change goes into effect or a month after, basically I'm retiring under a three year FAC period because you know, that's, that's gonna be the FAC that's higher. Um, to the extent that pay increases aren't as high as what might otherwise would be in normal circumstances, 
you might not get that big of a difference between three-year and uh, five-year FAC calculation. So that's also something else to, to take into consideration. But as I mentioned before, there is no, no right or wrong answer with respect to which groups should or should not be covered by, by any of these provisions. Okay, just so that, just to let the board know when I was reviewing these um, before the meeting the last couple of days, uh, I, I, I was leaning towards packages two and seven uh, as well. And just looking at the, the differences, uh, even though we end up at the same number, I would just want to see if uh, Mr. Drablo, Draslov thought that there might be one over the other that he would prefer. I know you're not here to advise us, but uh, I don't have preference on any package. I, I can give some uh, thoughts that the board may want to consider. The only other thing that I would mention with package seven is you're going to have a population that is covered under um, a compound cola. And then you're going to have a population that's covered under a simple cola. And that might be very challenging to explain if you had two retirees talking to each other and one saying, well, wait a minute, why, did, why is your cola higher than mine? We got the same percentage. And it's just because of the application of campound versus, versus simple. Just a, a communication challenge, but obviously that can, that can be overcome. And I think administratively, the administration system for APERS is set up for a campound cola. Obviously, things could could be adjusted for a simple colon, but that might be one other uh, consideration for the board. Thank you, sir. Madam Chairman, this is Larry Walther. May I ask you a question to David? Yes. David. Yes. David, whenever you look at uh, package seven and there's an amount that it affects the unfunded liability and it's $57.2 million. Is that an annual number or, and it, does it change uh, annually? Uh, does, and um, how, tell me a little more about that number because it does, it, it's curious that the same result between two and I think at two and, and seven in ultimately affecting the unfunded liability to 80%. The, I think the slide, Mr. Walter, that you're referring to is, is showing on the screen. 16, uh, slide 16 is what I'm looking at. Yeah, so that is a one-time reduction in the unfunded accrued liability. So column C on that slide, slide 16, would be what the reduction in the unfunded accrued liability would have been if these packages were in place June 30th, 2019. So instead of, so instead of our unfunded being 2.39 billion, it would have been 2.39 billion less the amount you see in column C. Correct. But that number the next year and, and, the, and subsequent years would change and apparently would change significantly over time in order to get the unfunded liability to 80% or to maintain it where it is. Well, the, the things that happen, if we're now talking about the projections, the, the, the reason that the unfunded gets affected beyond that period, A, is uh, the fact that members are being covered under those new provisions. We're getting more member contributions coming into the system. So remember the other component, one of the things we talk about is what we call the normal cost. And that's the cost of our active members accruing an additional year of service credit. And that's where we get the savings. We don't, if the employer contribution rate stayed at 15.32%, we would not need as much contributions to cover the cost of our active members accruing an additional year of service credit. And therefore that can go help to finance the unfunded accrued liability. In addition, the additional member contributions that are coming into the system are helping to help finance that unfunded accrued liability. Okay, well, uh, from my standpoint, um, obviously I think we need to make some move in the right direction to start uh, to uh, turn around this reduction. Of, well, I guess the, 
the increase in the unfunded liability that we've experienced over the last 20 years. And I know we can't do it over time. So I'm, I'm encouraged by this discussion. Uh, I guess uh, for, for the meantime, uh, or at this point in time, package two does seem to be a, a, attractive uh, to me also. And I just would, uh, uh, I, I guess my question from a, from a, the point of view of our the stakeholders, is it also maybe the most um, uh, agreeable or one that would be most uh, acceptable to uh, the different groups that we've talked about, the cities, the counties, and the employee association? And that, I guess that's for the, the chairman or any of the other members of the board that would like to address that. Yeah, I would comment on that. I, I would think that it would be in our best interest to have another special meeting in July and uh, define exactly what we're going to be looking at and uh, allowing the associations to uh, vet that back through their membership, their boards, uh, so we're all clear. And also, uh, I like the idea of a, a resolution format that states the facts and then states the policies like uh, has been drafted uh, in kind of broad terms. And uh, that could be put together uh, and, and that all could be uh, out, uh, that could be sent out to everybody concerned. And then we could have this special meeting and see if we can come to some kind of conclusion. Madam, Madam Chairman, this is uh, Daryl Bassett. Yes, Darryl, go ahead. Uh, I, I concur with the judge, but with this uh, with this addition, I, I think we should probably try to narrow this down uh, somewhat. Uh, we've got numerous packages here. I think we should try to narrow it down uh, to maybe three packages, four packages. I, I'm not set on a number, but uh, I think we should probably try to narrow this down before we have another meeting because uh, I just don't want to have another meeting with all of the packages on the table. I think we should probably try to narrow this down. I, I hear a lot of, uh, of talk about uh, package two. I hear talk about seven. I, you know, I, I just think we should... Uh, Everyone's reviewed these packages. We all know what's in these packages. I just think if we could narrow them down to maybe three or four packages, then our next meeting could be a little more precise where we're not shooting with a shotgun, we're sh shooting with a rifle. That, that, that would be my take. I agree with that. And that, that was, if I didn't say that, that would be the intent. I think there's, there, there might be some common ground on package two if package seven, it allows for more um, definition of the hold harmless provision, how the uh, different provisions would be uh, impacted or be implemented, the implementation language. Uh, you could uh, set it out in a, in a much more clear format. And uh, not only for the board's information and for the, to clarify the impact on our unfunded uh, crude actuarial liability, but uh, the other the other impacts. Um, so not only for the board's benefit, but for the association's benefit. Uh, if you read uh, if you if, if you read those letters, uh, they can more specifically um, assess the uh, the support that's out there. Whenever the uh, the uh, proposals are more narrowly uh, defined and and uh, communicated in a more clear fashion. So I, that's what I'm hoping and you know, two or three packages, if, ta if, if, if number two is it, if number seven with, you know, I think there was some clarification on that. Um, maybe those are two and seven's enough. Uh, and and uh, let's, let's uh, have the schedule, find a time in July that's agreeable to the, to the board, uh, have more details on, on a narrow approach and see if we can come to a conclusion that also allows those associations to uh, give some feedback. I'm chair. Madam chair, why are we married to the packages? Why couldn't we uh, take pick and choose from the different packages what we like and create 
a new package. It appears like we're agreeing on some basic things. So why wouldn't we just, you know, make up the package now that we've read all the different packages that we kind of agree on? Because it appears our agreement is based on the effect it has on, on two things, our system, each thing has on our system as well as on um, state employees. I've just thrown that out there. I, I think we could, uh, based on the discussion, we could probably come up with the package uh, that has all the elements in it. But I, 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 I didn't know we were gonna be married to a package and we had to vote on one package or the other. I thought it was still individual items in the package that we were interested in. Yeah, and, and I don't know that we are married to a package, Andrea. I think that, that uh, we have packages that we ask to be proposed. And, uh, and I think that that certainly is, is a, an option for all of us. I, it, it appears from what, what the discussion is at this point is that gravitating toward package two and seven and items are in those those uh, particular packages and uh, if we could focus more uh, closely on those areas of those packages that that maybe we like or maybe uh, if we if we would like to propose uh, uh, going forward with those two packages and then maybe adding a third with a combination of of areas in those packages that we seem to like to put together for a third package and maybe uh, uh, come back in July and get our uh, intake from our stakeholders, maybe that's an option that we would have uh, going forward and, and we could cut these packages down some. I think that's an excellent suggestion. It does seem like two and seven, and then maybe the third one could be a combination of those. I think that's an excellent suggestion. I agree. I think that's where we're going. I, I'm not married. Uh, this is Daryl, Madam Chairman. I'm not married to a particular package, but I think the components of those packages seem to be components that most uh, most of the board are at least concerned about, and I think should probably move forward. And so, yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not tied to any particular package, but the components of the package. And I think, uh, given the testimonies that we've had today, uh, I think those two packages probably address the concerns that we've had both from counties and the and the other present presenters today that uh, give us some food for thought. So uh, I'm not tied to any particular package, but I think we need to narrow this focus down for the next meeting so that we're not all over the board in the next meeting, that those the components within those two packages are, are those components that I think could, should comprise the bulk of our conversation. That's my point. Chair. Jason, go ahead. May I make a motion that the board forward package two and package seven to a special meeting in July for further consideration that would also give Municipal League and AAC and State Employees Association an opportunity to do a deeper dive and also give comment on. Uh, and that would be my motion and I am open for a friendly amendment. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Any and discussion? Yeah. I'd like this is Larry Walther. I'd like to make a comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, I, and I'm not sure where package seven came from. I mean, I, that sort of kind of came out of the blue here at the end. And I, uh, that wasn't even one that I was had on my on radar screen. Having said that, package two um, is, is a kind of a, a basic framework. And is, is it possible that between now and then that we also ask for a third and, and, and make some modifications if we think they need to be modified. They're a modification that people, that the, the board would like to uh, see the impact of. Like on, pack, on, on package two, I think we like the seven and we like the 7% the and the eight year phase in. Um, there might be a question on the five year active employees because of the legality of it. I think that we address that when we 
uh, uh, when David said that it's the, the higher of the three or the five, <clears throat> uh, and then um, the eight year, uh, the eight years, uh, I think Mr. Brady suggested seven years. Uh, yes, would, would we want to look at seven years? I don't know. And the uh, compounding, the uh, the COLA, uh, I think the COLA seems to be um, acceptable because it's only for new hires, as I understand it. So I just throw that out as a, if we, if we want to make some progress and maybe, uh, and get to a resolution next, at the next called meeting, we might want to, think about an additional uh, or an iteration of some of these things we've talked about today. I just I throw that out as a, I guess, more of a question. Which is right. kind of what I just said a few and minutes think, ago. Yes, right, and I think that's correct. I think that uh, we have uh, Jason's motion on uh, in a second on package two and seven, but I think that maybe if if you're willing, we could amend that and include maybe a motion that would include a third package that we uh, have Madam a conversation of those areas for that for that third package. Madam Chair, may I amend my original motion to add a third package that uh, follows Secretary Walther's recommendation? And I'll, I'll change my second to agree with that, and I would I would suggest that maybe Duncan uh, work with the board to flesh that out, so we would have some specifics, so they can uh, define that and run the numbers on it uh, after this meeting's over, unless we're going to clear that up before the end of the meeting. And, and well, we can absolutely I, do I that. Think, and oh. I think we probably need. To in the meeting about way on what we want in the third in the third package you're considering in this motion correct well no uh, madam chairman i would i would say that if we if we're going to amend the original motion uh then if we're looking at package two and package seven i concur with uh secretary walter that there probably needs to be some type of an assimilation between those two and I would concur that, yes, uh, let's create a uh, merging of the two, and, and then we've got a third package. Whatever that third package would be, that would be, that would require the board members, the various board members, whoever want to create uh, some kind of semblance between two and seven to create that package three. And then we could, con we could consider then the package two, package seven, and the alternative package that's been created. I would, I would concur that we, would, we should probably consider those three packages in the next meeting. You know, you know one possible thing, thinking about the vesting, it, it sounds like no matter what we choose there, it probably has a minimal impact. So, you know, if we look at package two as a framework and it sounds like there's general agreement on the member contribution rate and maybe on the, the COLA provision, I almost wonder if, you know, if you use package two as a framework and then and then maybe just look at an alternative package, you know, leave the vesting off of there, but just look at the FAC covering all actives, look at an option with the FAC covering new members and just consider the vesting as a separate question, uh, you know, since it appears to have a minimal impact from a financial standpoint. Mita, I don't know if you might have any comments on that, uh, just the logic behind that. Yeah. It's Package two, you're exactly correct, Duncan. It, if you were to change package two, just the vesting period, you could choose anywhere between five and 10 years, and it's not going to affect the results. The reason being, and this is what I was trying to articulate before, is the increase to the 7% member contribution rate sort of neutralizes that. So I don't think you're gonna see different results between the, the eight and the 10 years. If you alter the package two FAC period, to switch it from all actives to a version of package seven, non-vested and new hires, I do think you're going to see a significant change in that reduction of the unfunded accrued liability of the 125 million. Because I think the, the, the place you're getting that, because remember that there's no change in the unfunded because of the member contribution rate change. There's no change because of the vesting. 
and the COLA provision is new hires only, then you're going to be changing that reduction in the unfunded accrued liability for uh, package two. Remember the, the 57 million for package seven comes from um, basically the non-vested portions of the five years, the 10 year vesting, not, not much from the 10 year vesting, but the minimum 3% CPI is simple. It's not just new hires that affected non-vested members as well. So um, just items for consideration there. If package two, if you eliminate that FAC for all actives, you're going to reduce the reduction in the unfunded, I think pretty, pretty significantly. So, so I was just thinking just for purposes of getting, uh, you know, packages down on paper that I, I was just thinking if we take that one variable out, still consider that variable of vesting, but that, that would make it so that we don't have to do a five-year act is with eight-year vesting, five-year act is with seven, five-year uh, new hires with eight, with seven, with 10. You know, we can almost just consider the vesting question separate and maybe right. just have a couple of scenarios based off of package two plus package seven, if there's some general agreement on the other, other components of that. Yeah, I think the best, the best thing period could then just get discussed at the July meeting, whatever vesting period the board feels comfortable with, because I don't think it will change so, the numbers. Uh, so are you suggesting that we bifurcate the simple versus compound, compound uh, vesting, uh, non-vested versus new, uh, non-vested and new hires, simple non-vested uh, and new hires with the comp uh, compound new hires only. So we're going to bifurcate that particular issue and discuss that separately. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I was just thinking for the purpose of package two, you know, if, if we're looking at doing some variations of that, I was, I was just thinking we don't necessarily have to look at a specific package that has a 10 year vesting, eight year vesting, seven year vesting, five year vesting with all these other components rotating because the vesting appears to not have any or either minimal financial impact. I just thought, you know, if you just if you just kind of have that as a separate conversation, then that might simplify the process of uh, coming up with an alternative package. But but I may have complicated matters by throwing that out there, which is not what I intended to do. So no, I don't. I think that makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to you, the other board members, but yeah, uh, Mr. Beard, that, that makes sense to me. I don't know how the other board members feel about that, but that makes sense to me. Uh, Duncan, the main thing that I would like to have is when we meet the next time that we, uh, if we make some changes or if we want to consider some changes, we understand what the impact of those changes would be. And so, uh, uh, and I just, when I made the description earlier, I, it was uh, the two or three things that seemed to be um, maybe a little in question when you put it in light of the letters we got from the three, uh, the three groups. Okay. Madam Chairman, this is Gary. Yes, Gary, go ahead. Um, on the matter of the vesting period, I think uh, Jason Brady's comment about the seven years was very insightful. <clears throat> so it seems to me that, that uh, just as I said, the eight years is kind of a compromised position. I think the seven years uh, is a very good number that we could probably all agree on, especially since we're hearing that it doesn't affect the finances uh, very much. On the matter of the COLA, simple, and I think, I think I'm correct in what I'm getting ready to say here and looking at all these different options, the, the thing that makes a difference is whether on new hire, I'm just talking about new hires now, is whether you have a 3% com compound or the CPI or 3%. The question about the simple compound, the simple increase, 3% simple versus 3% compound makes no significant change in the numbers. 
So that discussion about 3% simple, in my opinion, is not really worth going there. It doesn't affect the numbers significantly. The only thing we need to discuss is whether on new hires, we're going to convert them over to the CPI or 3% compound. That's, that's my perspective on it. Thank you. I, could, could you weigh in on that, Mita? Because I think it does make a significant difference. But I could, uh, the compound versus simple. Yeah, I, I might have said it a little bit differently. I, I do think the lesser of the 3% or CPI is the more significant of the two changes. Um, simple versus compound does have, uh, there are, there is some significance there, but we go back to this slide. So if you look at just over the 10 year period, if you look at the difference between the compound and the lesser of 3% or CPI, for this hypothetical member, their benefit under the compound provision gets reduced from 13,439 to 11,751. That's a pretty significant reduction. But if you look at the change then from that 11,751 to the simple, it only goes down another $120. So the 11,751 to the 11,631. So that is significant. That's not to say it is, but it is definitely, definitely less significant than the change going from a straight 3% to the lesser of 3% or, or CPI. Um, I need a, need a clarification. Did I get a clarification? On number seven, package seven, what is the uh, COLA that applies to uh, current employees when they retire? And what is uh, what would apply to non-vested and new hires with regard to the COLA? So package seven, if we go back to this slide here, basically for any individual who's vested or currently retired, they get the 3% compound call. For any individual who is non-vested or new hire, they would get the far right-hand column. So it would be the lesser of 3% for the change in the CPI, but it would be based on a simple COLA as opposed to a campaign. All right, tell me again, what would the, a current employee who is vested get when he retires? Well, if they retire with a $10,000 monthly benefit, they would get a 3% compound call. Compound. Compound, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And that, that was my, Mr. Walther, that was one of my points I was trying to articulate earlier, is if package seven is adopted, you're going to have a portion of the membership covered under a compound COLA and a portion of the membership that's covered under a simple COLA. Now, obviously, you're also going to have different COLA percentages, but you're going to have that uh, communication issue as well. Which portion would be under a simple COLA? Those who are not vested? Not vested in new hires. Okay. All right. Um, that will probably be objectionable to the Employees Association of the counties and the cities. I agree. And I, I think there would be some complexity to administer that, that as well when you think about the logic built into the, um, the system around a compound COLA. You know, I, I think there is likely that there would be some complexity to split the population and then have different logic for uh, the new population. Madam Chairman, uh, Daryl Bassett, uh, there was a mention of a $10,000 monthly benefit. Uh, how, how does that apply to the average APERS uh, retiree? How many of them are getting a $10,000 a month benefit? I mean, perhaps I misunderstood that statement uh, that was just made uh, a couple minutes ago. Uh, let's put that in context. 
How do we put that in context? In, um, Mr. Bissett, the, the only reason we used a $10,000 benefit is just, it was a nice round number. It wasn't meant to represent the average benefit of, a, of an APERS retiree. It just allowed in the one slide where we were trying to show the application of the COLA, which was our slide 11, it, it was just a nice round number so that you can see, well, 10,000, if, if the 3% simple COLA, you just see the benefit increasing by $300. So it was just, right. it was never meant to, to convey what a, an average APERS re retiree is receiving right now. It was just meant I to be an example of retiree to show the application of the COLA. I understand, but see, and that, that's why I brought it to the attention of the board because I want the numbers to be applicable to our our average and our mean uh, salaries that our people uh, are making. And ten thousand dollar monthly benefit seems to be far beyond what would be the average or the mean benefit from for for APRS employees. And I think we need to, the board needs to take that into consideration. And, and, and I might have misspoke earlier. The 10,000 uh, in our slide could be monthly, it could be annual. It's just a, a $10,000 benefit. And if I misspoke earlier when I said a monthly benefit, then, then I misspoke. Right. Well, you said monthly. So that was a concern to me. Yeah. Okay. Ma Madam Chair, this is Jason. May I? Yes, Jason, go ahead. I, I am either happy to withdraw my amended motion so that we can have a cleaner one after further discussion. Uh, my main target or focus was to focus the conversation. So again, I just want to reemphasize that I'm happy to withdraw that uh, if, if we don't feel like that motion's helping us get to a final sort of package for a July meeting. And to that end, I'll withdraw a second. Uh, I think we're just wanting to bring this to a conclusion. Thank you, Judge. Well, I think. Thank you. Does anybody else have a suggested motion that they would like to put? Well, I just think that uh, I just think that Mr. Brady should perhaps modify his initial motion. I agree with the motion. I agree with the second. I think we need to streamline what the board is going to be talking about next uh, session into perhaps two. Uh, maybe three uh, discussion areas. Uh, I just think we need to, you know, today is a starting point, uh, but I, I think we have large agreement on on at least two areas and, and go, hearkening back to some of the comments that uh, Secretary Walter said, uh, I don't see why we can't uh, look at at least two of the packages not being tied to any of the provisions of the package, but the components of the package, uh, and then have some type of alternative out there as a third uh, area that, that uh, aggregates those two packages into something that we can at least have a discussion, discussion about. I just don't think that it's gonna be fruitful for us to come back uh, into the next meeting and have 11 packages that we're talking about once again. I think uh, I think this meeting, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, we, we should we should be able to kind of aggregate those and, and, and come down to at least two or three. Madam Chair, I have a motion. Yes, please, Brad, go ahead. I move that we take package two, package seven, and request that the executive director get with DRS and come up with an amalgam for a third package based on the discussion today and bring it back to us at a July meet special called meeting. I will second that motion, please, Madam Chair. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any discussion on the motion in the second? Hearing none, uh, I'll, they, I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. The motion carries. And Duncan, 
uh, you understand what the motion is and we'll uh, uh, look to you to create conclusion uh, of the, the uh, two packages then based on the discussion. Absolutely. I'll, I'll work with GRS on that and I'll also uh, reach out to y'all to uh, figure out a, a good date that will work for everyone in July and coordinate with the board on that. Great. I think that that would be great. And, uh, and if we can come up with, with that proposal uh, generally sooner rather than later and send it out to our stakeholders uh, to get any comments from them at our July meeting, I think that that would be very appropriate. Uh, Duncan, do you have anything else do you want to add for this meeting? Uh, that, that is everything I have today. I, I think we've made uh, tremendous progress from, you know, where we started many months ago. And uh, uh, yeah, I think we've made a lot of progress and look forward to the July meeting. Right. Thank you, everyone. I think we've got, had a great discussion this morning and really thank you, GRS, for your, uh, for your presentation. That's been very, very helpful to all of us uh, through this process. And we will look forward to having a special meeting to consider our three, uh, three other proposals in July and listening to our stakeholders. And our next regular meeting is scheduled for August the 19th at 9 a.m. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion and second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Yeah. And good day. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Bye.